let's do this thing. So, hey guys, this is Steve Malin, family music composer, here to help you build the music business of your dreams. I'm excited today because we are both on YouTube Live and recording a podcast episode at the same time, the Sonic Storytellers podcast. So this is exciting. So over the next hour, we're going to be talking about how to build a successful music composer brand with YouTube podcasts and books. Now, I might be wondering why we're talking about this now. Well, I just got back from PodFest, which was in Orlando, the PodFest Expo 2019, uh, a ton of fun. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but over the next hour, we're going to be uh, jumping through an overview of my experience there at PodFest, which was incredible. Um, we're going to be talking about content branding strategies for those three platforms, YouTube, podcasts, and writing a book. And then we're going to have a Q&A at the end for about 10 minutes. And then I have some really big news to share with you guys. So it's going to be a ton of fun. Um, and so if you haven't yet, get out pen and paper and start taking notes. You are about to receive a fire hose of incredible insights. Um, it's going to blow your mind. And, and to be clear here, I have a notebook here. It's filled with about 20 pages of notes. Um, and I spent a couple hours this morning consolidating them into like five pages um, just to kind of give you the best of the best uh, from this conference and how you guys can uh, be encouraged by that. So without further ado, I want to stay on track here because we only have an hour. Um, so for those of you who showed up early, you're in for a treat. There's a lot of uh, great insights here. And just as a disclaimer, I'm going to be throwing out some links, some, some URLs uh, throughout this discussion. Um, so don't worry about rushing off and, and jumping to those URLs right now. Uh, I'll tell you them throughout the talk. But um, at the end of this, in the podcast show notes and in the YouTube video in the description, I'm going to have all of those links that you can go to afterwards and can research your face off. Um, so I'm excited. Let's dive into this thing. So just the, the PodFest itself, a little bit interview or, or overview about that. Um, it was in Orlando down in Florida last week. Uh, it's an incredible experience, several days long. And I actually had the opportunity to room with creators of several of the leading audio dramas, which are fiction uh, audio podcasts, um, including the creators of We Are Alive, Liberty Critical Research, White Vault, Mars Fall, Girl in Space, 2298, and many more. Um, so it was kind of like um, your favorite sitcom, but with audio drama people. So it was a lot of fun. I got to just chat at, at length with these people about their creative process, and uh, it was a ton of fun. Uh, the the PodFest, PodFest experience itself, um, it's so many phenomenal sessions there with leading entrepreneurs John Lee Dumas, Chandler Bolt, Nate Woodbury, Pat Flynn, Roberto Blake, and so many more. Um, in fact, there were so many sessions that I will definitely be checking out the online video library to watch the talks that I missed because I was super jealous of some of the ones I couldn't make it to, but I had to pick you know, which ones do I think will be the most beneficial for my time here. Um, so if you're interested at all in uh, attending PodFest 2020 next year at the World Center Marriott Resort in Orlando, Florida, um, you can actually purchase early bird VIP tickets for a considerable discount, like 80% off um, for a very limited time. I am not um, a sponsor. I'm not sponsored by them at all. I just had an incredible experience. So um, I'm not allowed to put the link publicly, uh, but if you are interested in that, you'll actually get full access to all of the recordings from 2019, including the chats that, that I got to have um, and the ones that I got to present at. Um, and this is an exclusive link that I received as a VIP speaker. Uh, so I can't put it publicly, but I encourage you guys to take advantage of it because you'll get to book a VIP ticket for next year at an 80% percent discount and you'll get to um, have access to all those recordings. So if any of you are interested in that, shoot me an email, steven at stevenmalin.com or hit me up on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, Instagram. Um, and that, that can be an extremely valuable resource for you guys. As you're about to find out, uh, there's a lot of good stuff here and it's just, it's hard to take it all in one, in one sip, so to speak. Um, but make sure you grab your notes. In fact, those of you out there on the live chat on YouTube, if you have your notes and your pins ready, let me know. Put a little a writing emoji or a or book emoji. That way I know you're ready 
to be blasted with a water hose, a fire hose of content here. Um, so I got to speak on Thursday last week on two different panels during the audio drama track, which is where we talked extensively about how to create effective music and sound design for effective storytelling. Uh, a really cool panel there, uh, getting to chat with with really the, the leading audio drama creators in the world. Uh, so that was tremendous fun getting to, to be a part of, of their group. So let's dive into the meat here. Um, I wanna focus this next section for about 30 minutes. It's a lot of content, but if you have your notes ready, um, we're gonna dive into this thing. We're gonna talk about YouTube, we're gonna talk about podcasts, and we're gonna talk about writing a book and how each of those you can build extreme authority with and how you can almost instantly up your branding and your marketing and get more gigs and get paid more. So pay attention to this, this is a lot of good stuff, okay? Um, and, and throughout this, this process, I'm gonna be um, talking about some personal conversations I got to have with some of my podcast and YouTube heroes. Uh, and, and how I plan to take this information and channel it moving forward. Um, I'm always learning as, as a creative, we should always be learning. None of us are perfect or have it all figured out. So when we uh, get this mentorship and when we are able to um, learn and, and take notes and apply it, you're gonna see so much uh, transformation in your own career. So let's talk about YouTube first. So YouTube, um, most of you, I believe, are YouTube creators, or at least I hope you are. I encourage you to be. Um, it's the easiest of the three platforms to get into because you just gotta create a channel and start making videos, right? Um, so I had the awesome opportunity to talk with um, Roberto Blake after one of his chats, um, hanging out in the hallway. And some of his personal advice to me in my channel is, as you may notice at this point, I have about 7,500 subscribers, which I think is kind of a lot, but a lot of times we, we have these self doubts about, oh no, I don't have 100,000 subs. I don't have a million, so I'm not quite where I need to be. Um, and he had some really great advice about that. He said, having over 10,000 subscribers is meaningless. It only takes a thousand loyal fans to have a sustainable long-term business. So you should always focus on going deep with your audience instead of wide. I thought that was really good. Um, and another speaker, Nate Woodbury of Be The Hero Studios. Highly encourage you to look him up. He has a lot of cool content. Uh, he's a highly successful YouTube coach. And so he's always working with creators to help them scale their growth and to, to have more of an impact on uh, their audience. So. He shared in his keynote that you should always research keywords before scripting and filming. He has a, his favorite tool of all time is called Keyword Magic. And I'll leave a link in the description in the show notes there so that you can check that out. But it's a tool that you can just type in some keywords, some, some subjects that you want to make videos about. Um, let's say music business. That's my big thing. Um, but what it's going to do is there is a button on there that turns all of the keywords, all of the SEO, the search engine optimization, and it actually turns them into questions. Whoa. And what happens is it converts your keyword search into the commonly most searched questions on YouTube. So what people are typing at the top of that bar um, or typing in their phone, that's phenomenal because most people actually ask questions on YouTube versus just type in a subject matter. So when there's a specific question in mind, you can actually hit right at that. And that's gonna make a significant difference in the number of people that actually choose to jump on your video and to click it because those titles are so important. Title kind of sells everything, right? Um, and so Nate Woodbury in his talk, very excited about this one. He talked about the analogy of a tree. So if you imagine a tree for a second, you have your trunk, you have your branches, you have leaves. Um, and he talked about how the trunk of a tree, if we were relating this to our channels, it's the overall message of your brand. So for me, music business for family first composers. The branches then are the general topics, which is how to earn more income, music business growth strategies, whatever those general topics are for you. And then each individual leaf is a specific video. 
And you can think of this maybe as like a chapter in a book. And it's a very niched down as much as possible to go deep with one searchable topic. So the idea here is to create videos that are super, super, super niche, that are very deep, not wide. And that way, when people are asking that one question or asking that one specific um, problem, right? They're, they're kind of searching for a solution to their pain or whatever what's going on. You are automatically going to be a, the authority on that topic because it's so small and so niche within all of that, that that one little leaf is going to answer their question, solve their problem. And so what you do is you create a bunch of leaves and over time you have this huge mass of hundreds of videos that solve the full gamut of your ideal clients, uh, problems. And that's like the best way to, um, for free help all of their problems. Right. Um, and then of course they'll pay you, um, after that, uh, when they want to go deeper and they want to actually apply what they're listening to because information alone doesn't do anything right for us. Right. Um, Nate also talked about the YouTube algorithm and how it favors videos of length seven to 16 minutes. And he said that 10 is the golden number. And so when you're creating content, don't do 40 minutes, don't do hour long interviews. And I, I am super guilty of that one. I love to ramble. Um, instead focus on really short length. Now we're not talking like two or three minutes. That's not long enough. Um, instead focus right in that golden ratio of seven to 16 minutes. That way you get a hundred percent view time within the videos. Um, and that way, the algorithm is all about watch time. And so for exponential growth in your channel, upload five episodes per week. Now that sounds insane. And when, when I first heard that, I was like, what five episodes a week, that's daily. That's making something every day. Who has time for that? You know, heck I'm a composer. Like I'm working on projects and I'm doing all these different things, uh, making products. How on earth am I supposed to make five videos a week? The most I've ever done is three consistently for a long period of time. And even that was, was very challenging. And now I'm like down to one, you know, um, because I put so much more thought and energy into the production. But he said that, um, of all of the like highly, highly successful YouTube channels he's worked with, the YouTube algorithm is all about the consistency. And so what's interesting is I'm going to take his word for this um, because he knows way more than me about this. He said that if you upload five episodes per week and do this for four months consistently, YouTube will start promoting your channel in recommended videos, which is actually by far the most viewed video. That's how people find your videos. If they're not searching for it, then it's a recommended video from something else that they're watching. And that's kind of how YouTube works. You watch one video and you watch another and another, and eventually you find some new person you didn't know about, right? And you subscribe to their channel. So really that second slice is, is going to be the, the biggest and most influential parts for your career is to make sure that you are staying consistent. So think about that and see how, think about how you can implement that into your life. Um, so the question is, you know, how do you do this? How, how about the heck do you, uh, upload five episodes per week with a busy life? And his best recommendation for that is to record 20, that's right, two, zero, 20 episodes in one day every month. Bring five changes of clothes or whatever and batch record to cover the next four weeks, Monday through Friday videos. So this is really smart. So what he does is he takes his clients and his YouTubers and they'll go to a studio or whatever. They'll, they have the nice equipment, but they'll go to a different location and they will actually film for eight hours, nine hours, nonstop. And what they do is they now have 20, 10 minute episodes. That's a lot. It's 200 minutes. Um, but they have these 20 episodes and they scripted them throughout the previous month. So what you're essentially doing is if you can do this once and have 20 videos in stock, you can create your channel, put 20 out, and then you have a full month to script 20 videos. And chances are, if you are very confident in the skill set you're trying to teach or the software you're trying to review or whatever it is, you can talk about it and you're not going to have any lack of words. Um, cause when we talk about what we're passionate about and we talk about what is helpful for people, it just kind of naturally flows. Um, and how cool is that? You know? Uh, so 
the other thing he talked about is when you're when you're working on your channel, you should brand your channel with consistent color schemes and thumbnails across all of your videos. You should aim to convey a very specific feeling. Consider what value that you're bringing to your audience. If it's not bringing value to them, then what's the point? You're wasting your time. Um, so for a great case study, for those of you who want to like really study this, this idea, go look at Evan Carmichael. He has an incredible YouTube channel and specifically study his thumbnails, specific, uh, study his specific titling and the messaging that he brings. It's super clear. If you don't know him, he's all about the word believe. Um, it's super inspirational stuff and millions of views. So it's a very good channel to study and to copy some of those best practices for your own channel. Um, so some ideas to make sure that you're including in your thumbnails are uh, for high click rates are include a face, include your face in every single video or in every uh, thumbnail. Uh, keep it simple. Use the rule of thirds. So your face should be on the left or the right. And then you should be matching the aesthetic with your profile pic. So if you have a black and white profile pic, you should have a black and white uh, thumbnail. Not that you should do that, but you know, um, it should be intriguing. Um, it should make your audience when they see that thumbnail, they should go, Oh my gosh, I have to know what that video is about. Always design small. So viewers are watching these, you know, they're scrolling by on their phones and they're super small. So this thumbnail needs to boom, grab their attention first time, every time. And another consideration is to group similar topic videos. So the branches of the tree we talked about earlier is to group those similar topics into one thumbnail style and repeat this for all of your groups. That way, every single group has a different style, but it's all within the umbrella of your style. And this will considerably increase your watch time and clicks because someone will click on how to get your first music gig, right? They click on that one has a very specific style to it. And then all of a sudden, let's say it's a blue thumbnail, then in their feed, the recommended videos, they're going to see another blue um, branded by you, uh, thumbnail. And it's going to have to do with a very similar general topic, which is maybe in that, that how to earn more income style, right? And maybe that one's about how to charge clients for income. That way your groups all have similar color schemes. And that way each of your groups can kind of have their own separate playlist within YouTube world. Um, and that way you are actually pruning your clients and you can study your analytics to see which one of those topics is actually performing the best. And there's a you know, whole slew of things you can do there. Um, so as we're, as we're going through this chat, especially for you guys on YouTube live, if you have questions, start writing them out and I'll, I'll make sure that I'll check those for the Q and a at the end of it. Um, but any questions as I take a sip of water, any questions on YouTube? All right, moving on to podcasts. So a lot of you are not on podcasts and I don't know why, to be honest, because podcasting is actually easier than YouTube videos because there's no visual and you can record them on your phone as a voice memo and you can upload them instantly. Um, you can literally make a five minute podcast in five minutes every day. And in fact, I've been really inspired to start doing that. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so moving on to a podcast. There are many platforms for hosting, um, but of all of the different companies out there, the one that's been recommended to me the most and the one that really stands out to me is called Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N. It stands for Liberated Syndication. So that one really caught my attention over the, the rest due to its low monthly costs, its robust built-in analytics, its easy opt-in to all major podcast distributors, which includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and a bunch of others that I didn't even know existed. And not to mention, once you reach milestone download numbers, they actually contact you personally for sponsorships within your industry niche. So they're already doing that for you. They're doing so much work for a very low monthly cost. So I have decided already um, that I'm gonna be switching from Squarespace, which is where I have my website, which is where I've been hosting my my MP3 files um, with no analytics, with none of those features. Um, I'm gonna be switching that to Libsyn very soon. So I'm very excited about that. Um, when it comes to podcasts, 
It is highly recommended to go super short, so three to five minutes in length, or super long, 40 plus minutes. Because you got to think about podcasting. When people listen to a podcast, they're either driving for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes plus, right? Or they are cleaning or they're, they're, they're exercising. They're doing something that's either super short and they just want a really quick tip on something that they search for, or they want this long explanation, a really long how to do something, a really long explanation or an interview, uh, which is why interviews work so well with podcasts because it's basically a radio, right? It's kind of replacing that for people on their phones. So you got to think about that. Uh, don't go in the middle. This is totally opposite of YouTube. So the danger that some people have is they might convert their YouTube audio into podcasts, but they don't think about the length. So if you are hitting 10 minute YouTube videos, they don't quite convert super well um, because they're, they're not three to five minutes and they're not 40 plus minutes. So it's not exactly a great conversion there. Um, so think about that, right? When you're, when you're creating a podcast. So I had the chance to talk with Roberto Blake. Um, and for those who don't follow him, he is a phenomenal YouTuber and podcaster. Um, he has a lot of great thoughts on entrepreneurship. And so I've learned a ton from him. So it's really cool to get to meet him in person. Um, and he told me that for many creators, converting audio from YouTube video is an easy podcast series because you've already done the work, right? Why not just strip it out and maybe cut off the beginning and the end and put your own custom intro, custom outro, whatever, right? And that's what I've done with the Sonic Storytellers podcast. I'll be totally honest there. And it, it doesn't make it, it um, disingenuous. It just means you have to be very selective. So I have hundreds of YouTube videos, but they don't all work well for podcasting. So I've had to actually prune through and choose the episodes that I think really fit well to an audio format that don't have to do with visuals. And so it's a, it's, there's some work there. You have to um, chop them up and edit them. I use Pro Tools to do that. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's not an option. So I have personally decided that I will continue doing that with appropriate YouTube videos such as this right now. This is a podcast episode because there is no visual information that you have to have to follow along. Um, so that's, that's one way of doing it. But on the other side, this was really funny that I talked to Roberto Blake at one point in this day. And then another point of the day, I had the awesome opportunity to talk with Pat Flynn, who's another one of my YouTube heroes and podcast heroes, Smart Passive Income, or Ask Pat if you know those shows. Very, very, very popular. Um, also, in, like an entrepreneurship coach. And he told me that he actually suggested the opposite, uh, which is not wrong. It's just a different opinion. And he said he would actually rather see me create unique content for my podcast audience to support my YouTube channel. He says that my audio consuming audience has different preferences. For example, I can make a YouTube video showing a new sample instrument, which I do a lot, and I can invite the creator of the sample instrument onto my podcast to interview about their creation process and intended use. And by doing this, I can actually get two different angles of the same topic and offer affiliate marketing deals to my audience in two different ways. So in this scenario, I'm actually using YouTube videos as the show and the podcast portion as the tell in the show and tell process, right? And what's cool about this mentality is I wouldn't be boring either audience. So it's a win-win. So with this advice, of course, you can apply this however you wish, but for me, I'm going to apply it like this. I'm going to keep making Sonic Storytellers podcasts because that's an easy YouTube to podcast conversion, but I'm also going to very soon create another short form only podcast that focuses on bite-sized teachings in that three to five minute category for composers on the go who need quick wins in their career. So I think there is great value in doing both. And ultimately it's the same content. We're just repurposing it for different audiences and making sure it all works in tandem together. So I'm excited to uh, jump onto that, um, onto that path and to see how well that works. And if that does in fact resonate with a totally different segment of my audience that I haven't quite been catering to. And in, and in doing so, of course, that grows my audience. So how cool is that? Um, so here are some tactics, almost done with this podcast part. Um, so again, if you're not taking notes, 
what are you doing with your life right now? This is good stuff. Uh, I, I was hyped when I got this information. So John Lee Dumas, you might notice him uh, from the Entrepreneurs on Fire podcast, also superstar in the podcasting world. Uh, he gave a talk on the four tactics for creating a successful podcast. And we all need to take notes on this one. Um, I'll run through them real quick. Number one, topic. It needs to be all about passion, expertise, curiosity, and adds value to my audience. You can't have a podcast, a successful podcast without all four. Because you can be passionate about what you're talking about, but you might be an idiot and you're not helping anybody, right? You can have all the expertise in the world, you can have all the degrees in the world, but if you if you talk like this and talk about music business and how it changed your life, right? There's no passion there, no one cares about that. Um, if you're not curious to learn more and talk about new and exciting developments in your industry, what are you gonna teach about? What are you gonna talk about if you're always talking about the same old things, right? No one wants to hear that. And then last of all, you know, if, it, if you're not adding value to your audience, what the heck are you doing? You're just, you're just wasting your breath. No one's listening, no one's applying it, so they're not gonna have any transformation in their life. Um, so topic, gotta have a topic that really resonates on all four cylinders there. Number two for podcasting, have a clear avatar. Avatar meaning ideal client. This is the one perfect listener that needs your podcast. They need it so badly that they will never achieve your message. They will never have it in their lives without you. They need you. And if you don't show up and if you don't do, if you don't deliver, if you skipped, if you skipped a day on your podcast because you just didn't feel like doing it, that person's life is worse. And there's a lot of pressure with that, with that, with that level of influence and authority is people are actually listening. And if you choose a topic that resonates that deeply, man, you're going to have a very successful career. And in this case, a very successful podcast. So some questions to ask yourself are, what does this episode need to best serve my avatar? Because if you're not serving that one ideal person, you're wasting your time. Another way of asking that is, what would my avatar, avatar want today? What does that person need? What encouragement do they need to hear today to be successful? Third, visually engaging. Your title must be clear. Only be clever if you can, if you can get away with it. But if your title is not clear, if it's, I don't know, uh, let's say you have a, you know, I'm talking about myself here. Let's say you have a music business podcast. If it's not clear that that's what it is, um, then, then no one's going to listen to it. No one's going to search for it. Right. Um, and you can only be clever. You can only get away with being clever if you want to. So actually with that in mind, I mean, you're listening now, this is the Sonic Storytellers podcast. Um, if you're listening on the, on the podcast version of this, I'm curious, I want to hear from you. Is that title effective for you? Does that actually resonate with you? It might not. It doesn't even have the word music business in it. So, you know, Hey, I'm here to learn. I'm here to grow. So I would love to hear from you guys. What do you feel like? Is that, is that clever or is it clear or is it both? It probably airs on the side of clever and not clear. So who knows? Maybe that's something that needs to be updated. Um, but anyway, the second thing within visually engaging, it has to have a tagline and subtitle four to six words. That's it. Can't go over that. Um, it just gets lost because think about this. You are competing with 25 plus podcasts in one scroll. Someone's going through, oh, what do I want to listen to today? Boom. They just missed it. Boom. They just missed it. Boom. They just missed it. Um, it didn't catch their attention. So that visual engagement is paramount. It's like walking through Target or Walmart or something, and there's, you know, thousands of products all around you. Boom, that one caught your attention. Why? Because it had really good packaging. It had really good font. It had really good color. It, something about it, boom, stole your attention. So you gotta be that. So your logo needs to jump out and grab your avatar. The best way to do this is to pick a pain point, pick something that they need. So for me, my music business peoples, you listening right now, you need freedom in your life. You need 
time in your life. You need choices in your life. So you need a visual that, boom, pulls on that. This logo, it must win at a tiny size alongside hundreds of other podcasts, right? It has to be visually engaging. Uh, so a suggestion there is when you're creating your, um, your image, when you put your podcast title on it, use 100% of that small square space with super large fonts. Max it out 100%. Do not put a tiny little title in the middle with your face or something. It needs to maximize that space that we're not wasting any real estate uh, or else people won't see it, plain and simple. And then number four, practice. You won't be good the first few times you do podcasts or YouTube videos for that matter. Uh, we all absolutely suck when we start and it's just it's just how it goes. You have to, you have to just practice. You have to get in front of people a lot shoot, you know, I'm on a YouTube live stream right now. I used to be absolutely, uh, petrified, uh, of <laughs> jumping in front of a crowd and talking about something. What are people going to think? What are they going to do? What if they say negative things in the comments? You know, whatever. I'm well past that point, but, uh, I feel like I can, I can be myself and be comfortable with you guys, but, um, you got to get past that. And the only way to get past that is to practice. And that way, um, you can always be yourself. You can always, you know, there's nothing to expose if you're always honest. So that fear of failure, who cares? We all fail, you know, let's fail forward together. Let's learn from each other's mistakes and experiences, but vulnerability is so, so important. Um, last little point for podcasting. We'll move on. John Lee Dumas the guy, uh, speaking and, and, the. Uh, creator of the Entrepreneurs on Fire podcast, he also mentioned that you should have six episodes weekly. That's the magic number that he sees. And he's also a, a podcast coach. So he knows these numbers ins and out, ins and out. the ins and outs of the podcast industry. Um, and we do this, we can prepare six episodes weekly by don't create a show yet. So in my case right now, I am planning ahead with this new podcast. I'm going to take probably a month or two. I don't know how much time I can put into this yet, but I'm going to prepare a month and a half content in advance. So if this is, this is, it's a lot of episodes. So that's uh, six episodes times six weeks. So that's 36 episodes, right? Uh, but they're five minutes, they're three to five minutes. It's literally a thought that I want to share an encouragement I want to give. It's a lot of episodes, but if you do this very much like the, the YouTube advice earlier from Nate Woodbury, um, about creating, you know, 20 in a day, that's really all you got to do. You just got to bulk this stuff out, take an entire work day. Um, or perhaps if you're part-time right now, take a couple hours each night for a week, whatever it takes, um, churn out these large, amount of content and then sprinkle them out. Go ahead and schedule everything forward. Um, and, and set those release dates, release dates six weeks in advance. Um, and what's going to happen is people, once they find one episode, they're just going to binge it. It's like Netflix. How cool is it when you find a show that you can really resonate with? You just love it. And then boom, you just watch episode after episode. Um, that's kind of what you want when people find your content. And I'm very grateful that I've been consistent with YouTube for many years now. So when people find my channel, they're kind of blown away because they're like, oh my gosh, you have like hundreds of videos on these things. This is answering all my questions. That's very fulfilling for me. And that's very, very helpful uh, in my career because that's how I get paid. That's how I make a living at this is because people find a piece of content that really resonates with them. And then they click on the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, and so I want the same success from podcasting. I, I, I totally admit that I'm new to podcasting. Um, that's why I was so, um, blessed to be at PodFest, learning from the masters of the industry, um, how they do it. So I'm excited to jump into this kind of new territory. And I hope you guys will, you know, test that out with me and help me grow in that as well, as I hope I can help you grow in yours. Uh, so moving on to this, this last subject here before our Q and a. So if you have questions, throw them up there. I can't answer them yet, but let's, let's get a good 10 up there before we jump in. So we're not wasting anybody's time. Um, we'll get there in a few minutes. The last subject I want to talk about today are books. And this is something that no one talks about. I don't know why, because, uh, this may be the most impactful thing you hear today. 
Um, this might be the exact encouragement you need to hear because no one talks about it. Um, and it's this idea of writing a book. We don't really talk about this because writing a book has kind of always been this insane notion. It, like who does that? You know, that's like years off your life. It's like training for a marathon. Who wants to do that? You know, give me the 5k, any 5k runners out there or 10k. Like I'll do a 10k. You know, I'll run six miles. I'm not going 25 miles. You kidding me? And I think we put these mental barriers that we say never, like that is not even possible in my life. And we set up these roadblocks for no reason. But if you start to think about what if, what would be the result if I did persevere and I did achieve that? What, what could the outcome look like? Here's what might happen for you. Um, and here's the reasons I believe, and this is what the PodFest people's uh, very successful authors at this stage were saying. Um, the word author is the first six letters of the word authority. Writing a book gives you instant credibility. So much credibility that when recently polled, um, I don't even know what the study was, but they were mentioning this study. Maybe you can go, <laughs> those of you who, who buy the ticket, you can, you can go back and watch these on the writing portion. But the average person, when asked, who do they trust? You know, doctor, blah, 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 PhD. This person, um, Nobel Prize, right? This, over, this person over here, TED speaker. Or this person over here, author, best-selling author. Uh, the stats prove that they, they choose the author because there is a credibility and expertise associated with writing a book. And the best part is your book could suck. Your book could be awful. And people might still believe that about you. Now, of course, I'm not encouraging you to write terrible books, but the idea that being an author, like there are so many authors out there, I have not read their books, yet I have a perceived notion that they are experts at what they do. I don't know that. I haven't read the book. Um, but we have this idea that, oh, if there's, you know, a thousand five-star Amazon reviews, then it must be valuable, right? Um, and if you think about it, the cost of writing a book, it, it might cost you a thousand bucks or something, depending on how how in-depth you want to go with this. But you can also do it for free. You can self-publish. Um, you can edit yourself. You can do these kind of things. But when you compare that to a hundred thousand dollars to get a degree, right? Sometimes more plus several years off your life compared to a book that you could write in 90 days. If you really just sit down and do it, the investment, the return on investment is so exponentially higher than anything, just about anything else you could do in your life. Um, that it's almost mind blowing to consider why no one else is doing this. I don't know. I don't know why people don't do it, but um, this is a, kind of a wake up call for me uh, listening um, as someone who wants to build authority, who wants to build a brand, right? Because uh, here's why. When you write a book, not only does it give you instant credibility, it leads to speaking engagements. It leads to higher rates every time. It leads to more gigs because you are now in front of thousands of people um, in an expert, authoritative way. You're not just another YouTuber. You're not just another podcaster, right? It's not normal to be an author. It might be one day, um, but it truly is the ultimate business card. Instead of handing a card at a conference, can you imagine if you said, oh, just look me up on Amazon or literally pull out your backpack, hand them a book. Oh yeah, I wrote this. It, it just blows people away, right? Uh, they, they just, that's not normal. That's so outlandish to think that you could do that, right? Um, but get this, if you wanna write a book, fastest way to do it, create an outline, dictate, speak one chapter at a time. Use voice memos on your phone or drag and dictation. Send this voice recording to rev.com, rev.com, and a human will transcribe it into audio, will, will transcribe the audio into text for you. Boom, and you now have a chapter. And that may have taken you 15 minutes. You just wrote a chapter of a book in 15 minutes. Um, you outsourced. Yes, you paid a few dollars. Or, heck, do it yourself if you, if you have all the time in the world. 
do it yourself and and edit your own speech because we we talk about 10 times faster than we can write doesn't matter how talented you are at typing um we just do now you might not keep 100 percent of that you might keep 20 percent of what you actually do uh say but there is an incredible amount of a wealth of knowledge in that so once you've done this you just do a chapter a day essentially you put it together 12 chapters is a book intro 10 meet chapters and an outro next steps if you will make it pretty make it look nice maybe take a month cleaning it up make it look pretty you have yourself a book it's not rocket science it's just not something people deconstruct enough and then what you do if you want to market that book because you can't have a successful book um, unless you market it you form a launch team with very clear expectations dates and rewards very much like a kickstarter you incentivize people to join a team to kind of do that legwork for you. Um, and doing so creates a, a successful book launch because now everybody in your world knows about it, in your industry. Um, and it creates a buzz around it. So two things you should never do yourself, though, because you can fund all of this yourself. You could uh, do it all for free, pay, pay in time, right? Um, how to uh, Two things you should never do yourself. You should never create a cover yourself unless you are a professional and a super professional graphic designer you gotta hire that out because a bad cover equals a fail book um, people really do judge a book by its cover second thing you should never do yourself is you should never edit yourself you can certainly like fix your grammar mistakes and whatever but you need other opinions you need your audience to see your book they need to proofread it for mistakes and they need to help you with the order of things. And having these conversations with people will help you get a, a logical order to help create a through line, a narrative from start to finish that creates a process, it creates a step-by-step -step guide, if you will, to a um, transformation that you're trying to offer people. And that's the book portion. And we'll hint at that. Hopefully that, that's a little hint for something a little bit later. Um, but just to recap, hopefully this is valuable for you guys. Um, let me know in the, in the comments if you're watching this in the replay or if you're in the live chat or heck, if you're, you're listening to the podcast, you want to shoot me an email or leave a review, that would be super helpful. Um, but let me know what, what in this chat is helpful for you. Um, what, what are you going to do about it? It's a lot of information. It doesn't mean anything. If you don't do anything with it, you got to apply it to your life if you want transformation. Um, so to recap, you can build brand authority in a lot of ways. We didn't even mention blogs. We didn't even mention ebooks. We didn't mention a whole lot of things, you know, social media. But our time is finite. We can only choose so much to focus on. So, my encouragement to you, my takeaway from this conference and just from the success I've seen in others recently and in my own life, the three platforms that you should be focusing on all of your time and energy on are making YouTube videos for visual people, making podcasts for audio people, and writing a book for tangible um, literary consumers. And you know what the cool part about this is? When you write a book, you can turn it into an ebook, which is digital, which reaches thousands more, hundreds of thousands more people, and you can turn it into an audio book by narrating it yourself. In doing so, you have now the trifecta of media backing you up. And you, some of you might be asking, but where does social media fit into all of this? I thought social media was a platform to do this with. I don't believe social media is a platform for um, business growth. Rather, I think it's a platform for building personal relationships with people. Because when you build those relationships, then you can connect them to your products and services and build a business. So that's my spiel. Hopefully that is helpful for you. So what we're gonna do now, um, I wanna take maybe five, 10 minutes. I wanna answer some of your questions, pop them in the chat now. We'll have a quick Q and A and then stick around because I have some really big news that I wanna share with you guys. Um, and I wanna try to squeeze it in right before three o'clock Eastern Standard Time over here. So shoot your questions up there and I'll, I'll get to as many as I can in the next few minutes. So let me scroll up. So Michael Harris 
um, if you're still in the audience, he asked, can you do this while learning or is this for someone already in the industry? Um, if you don't mind specifying what you mean by that, I might be able to circle back and get to that question. Um, Sean asks, is there a good way to approach YouTube if you only want to post music? That's a fantastic question um, because my audience, you guys are mostly composers, I hope, or want to be composers. Um, music is a tricky thing because music is both consumable as entertainment, but it's also a practical and usable asset within film, TV, games, apps, etc. So you're kind of riding the line between which of those two do you want it to be? So when you post music on YouTube, you better have a very clear picture of why you're posting it in the first place. Um, so the idea is this, if your goal is to make money off of that, then you need to find a way to monetize it. You need to find a way to, when you provide the free entertainment of your music, you need to also connect through that video. If we're specifically talking YouTube, you need to have some links in the description that get people to buy the track that you're soliciting or maybe to your um, a royalty free library, audio jungle, right? Something like that um, or Pond5 or maybe you're on um, premium beat or something, but you're trying to link people maybe with the bait, so to speak, your lead magnet is the free track that you're giving through YouTube for entertainment or for usage in their projects, but then you're linking them to something else that is going to make you the sale. So that's how I would use that. Um, that's actually something that I don't personally do. Um, not because it's not valuable, but I actually use streaming for that purpose. Um, YouTube music, and, and especially now since YouTube has crossed over into YouTube music, they now split the two things. Um, and YouTube Music is, an, is um, a partner with SoundDrop, which is where I put all of my soundtracks. So when I put things up there, it goes to Spotify, it goes to YouTube Music, Amazon, Pandora, etc. So it's one place to put my soundtracks and now they're actually being streamed and I get paid for every time it streams instead of YouTube royalties, which kind of, eh, um, they're not high. So I don't use YouTube for entertainment purposes because it doesn't pay very well. I use it for business building purposes, which is, to provide something free for people and then to provide something that they can pay for on the back end. But I love to always give that free value up first. Great question. Uh, Val Holocron asks, when you deliver your music to a client, do you mix down for specific streaming services? Maybe multiple. Uh, so when I deliver music to a client, um, it's usually the same mix. So I always teach to mix your master track to negative 0.1 decibels db and by doing that you're limiting it to where your your volume or whatever it never exceeds that point um we use compression and we use eq and we use, we use these different um plugins to try to get it, it to a good mix because honestly a good mix is a good mix it doesn't really uh matter but there are certain things like an iphone for example if you're uh or Android, if, if you're gonna be putting music into an app that is kind of mono by its nature, then you should just be very careful of uh, the frequency spectrum. So what I mean by that is there's usually sound effects in a phone game, a casual game, right? So you wanna make sure that you're kind of lobbing off the EQ of your high end of your music so that it doesn't clash when someone's playing the game on their phone, because that's not gonna have the same like bass response as studio monitors, right? No one's playing a iPhone game on the studio monitor. So you have to kind of think that through what's the end product. If you're writing for film, um, even podcasts, I mean, most people listen to podcasts in their cars. So they have decent like Bose uh, or Dolby surround sound or something. They have something in their car that's a little bit better than a phone quality. So there is some bass response. So you probably, if it's going to a podcast, then you're probably going to want to lob off the low end so that it's not so bassy especially when there's talking on top of it, because especially like my voice, I have a lower voice. So music has to be in the higher range. I can't, I can't write low music. Low meaning like cellos and, and bass and that kind of stuff because it, uh, it clashes with my voice. So you just gotta kind of think that through what's the end product and will my music support the project or is it going to detract? So always try to support in your mixing as well as the composition itself. Brian Skeel says, I have lots of great content planned for my YouTube channel, but my shooting location is the most unattractive basement studio in the world. This might be the biggest thing hindering me from coming up with tons of video game. Uh, t sorry. This might be the biggest thing hindering me from coming up with tons of video content. 
does that matter in the grand scheme of things or are there things I can do to compensate? So Mr. Brian, uh, that's kind of a two-parter. Number one, content, but the quality of your content always surpasses, uh, I, I need to think this through, make sure I'm saying it the right way. The quality of your messaging, so that's what I mean by content. So like the, the, the lesson you're trying to teach or the, the tutorial you're trying to give, the quality of that will supersede any amount of production quality. So if, if your visuals are weird because you're in an unattractive basement, so be it. People, you know, your audience will rally around you. But I suggest lean into that and make it a joke. So like if you're if you feel self-conscious about something like an ugly background, just kind of lean into it and make a joke about it. Um, and, and make sure that you're kind of acknowledging that it's not on purpose that you're like you're not trying to make a crappy video um i think your audience can sympathize with you there um but at the same time you might be better suited for a podcast because there's no visual and you can hit 100 percent professionalism from day one as long as you have a microphone you can record through your audio interface and the pro tools or a daw um and you, you are up there with you know the millions of of downloads of the bigger podcasts all because you just have to have one thing uh, video cameras, obviously, you know, DSLRs and things are very expensive and I'm not even there yet. And I've been doing YouTube forever. Um, I have not yet found, I don't want to say the reason, but it has not been something that I've been compelled to do just yet. It's something I want to do. It's just, um, I'm not at the point yet where that I'm, I'm compelled to drop 2000 bucks on a camera that's going to have a five, five to 10 percent quality increase from my iPhone. And that's just the truth. Um, doesn't mean it's not something I won't do eventually, but you know, just got to pick your battles there. Um, but focus on the content of your message. And I think that is going to have such a greater impact than focusing on the production because people don't really care about the production. They really don't. Um, but I will give one, one bit of advice that if you have to pick between good audio and uh, good visuals, always pick audio because audio can be translated into all forms of media. Video cannot. Bad video is bad video. Um, and bad video does not take people out of the viewing experience, but bad audio, people will always click away because think about this for a second. This is actually one of the, one of our talks and I highly encourage you, Brian and whoever else, uh, go check out the online portal for PodFest of 2019, there was a chat exactly about this subject. Um, so you would really benefit from that. But it was this idea uh, within audio dramas, you know, audio fiction, it's all audio. There is no visual. So they have to be so careful when they're crafting their sounds not to take the listener away from the experience. So like even one bad sound effect or one bad voice or one pop of the mic or really bad audio for even just a few seconds, what do we do as humans if if we see something we don't want to see like a, a horror movie or something right we close our eyes or we we shield our eyes that's like our, our natural uh response and we're escaping right we feel like we've we've escaped the the scary event um but if we hear something we don't want to hear we cover our ears but if we're wearing headphones or if we're in a car we turn it off we push the power button we take the headphones off right we we jump away and we don't go back. If you're watching TV, you flip the channel, you hit the mute button, you do something and it always takes you out of the experience and you're probably not going to go back. So this is paramount when we're talking about YouTube, because if you lose your audience, you're done. You, they might they may never come back and it's, it might just be one video in your list of 300, but because that one video had such a bad effect on people, they might not come back. So you really got to think from a branding perspective, you know, if you have some duds out there, get rid of them. Um, but if it add, if it adds value, then great. So that's why number one purchase I always suggest people make is a good microphone. Um, and even this one right here, the Rode NT1A. It's been my trusty steed uh, for several years. Um, and it's gotten me through all my projects. So even something as simple as this, it, it's going to make a profound impact versus recording with your phone, right? Um, last question, and we'll move on to the big news. I want to honor your time. Last question um, from Zach M. He says, did the conference mention audience participation at all? Should creators be interacting with chat or comments? 
Yeah, there there are several talks about that kind of stuff. Um, the idea with your audience is, uh, I think Roberto Blake's chat, the, his his public chat spoke on this the greatest. If you want to look it up, and and honestly, Roberto Blake is so great. He records his own stuff whenever he goes to conferences. I haven't checked, but I bet you, I could bet you a thousand bucks that it's on his channel by now. Um, the whole keynote. So look, look him up, Roberto Blake. You'll like, you'll like it a lot. But it, it was he, he talked about one thousand loyal fans um, is all you need. So yes, you absolutely should be one on one messaging and replying to every comment you can, um, and establishing that credibility. Because what's crazy now is now that I have, you know, seventy five hundred plus subscribers on YouTube at least. Uh, that's a kind of, that's a big number. I can't talk to 7,500 people a day, you know, I can, I could do global announcements and things, but it's, it starts to get more challenging because, you know, I'm getting, I'm not getting a comment a day. I'm getting like a hundred comments a day and it, and I'm sure people like Roberto Blake are getting thousands of comments a day. So <laughs> that's a little scary and intimidating to think, oh my gosh, how do I even do that? But I know people like him, he's, he's a very genuine dude and his goal is to answer every single comment. And he can't, there's no way you can't answer every single one, but I know that he'll scroll through and he'll see, you know, a hundred comments that day on that one video. And then he'll say, okay, every, you know, you know, uh, 37 of these comments are saying the same thing. Like, Hey, Roberto, what would you do in this situation? Or, Hey, uh, I really liked this part, right? People are going to generally, you can kind of lump together. What are the two or three questions that everyone's asking? Or what are the few comments that everyone it's kind of saying, and then you make a new video on that. Um, so audience interaction is everything. And that's why I love doing live chats with you guys. Cause I can actually answer your questions. I'm not guessing what you want to know. I can actually answer it directly. And this stuff really does influence me. So when you guys leave comments, um, and when you leave reviews for podcasting and, and these things, and you, and you send me emails and, and direct messages that, that really helps because I'm able to, to form those. I'm big on Google Docs, by the way. I would recommend you guys use that. Start lumping these things together and you can do what's called a word cloud. Um, they're free on, just search Google for word cloud. You can actually throw in like a novel's worth of, um, of text. You can just like copy and paste all the posts from your Facebook group or all of your emails, throw it in there and it'll actually pick out the top one or two words, top three words that people are using in their language. Um, which has actually been a game changer for me and how I've been able to choose my words of what to create my videos, my titles, my products, my services. It's a big deal. So yes, absolutely. You should do that. All right, guys, let's move on. Quick water break. I feel like I've been talking for an hour. Oh, wait, I have. All right, moving on to the big news. Thank you so much for hanging out um, this entire stream. I hope this was valuable for you, but I want to get on to the big news. So many of you know that for the last seven months, I've been writing a book um, and it's finally finished. Finally finished. So I'm super, super pumped about this. Um, I've had a lot of private chats with you guys. And those of you know, know who I'm talking about. A lot of you, I've asked for pretty constant feedback on things as basic as the title and subtitle and what colors should I use and what chapter titles should I use and what, what content, you know, like I've really, really been, um, pulling my audience considerably and having lots of conversations. So I like to think that this is a community collective book that I've just had the pleasure of pinning myself. Um, but it's called family first composer. Proven path to escape nine to five and support your family composing music for film, TV, and video games. I'm absolutely pumped about this. Um, the foreword is by Adam Gubman. You might know him um, either from the his over 550 projects with Disney and casual games and Ubisoft and all kinds of things. He's an extremely prolific composer, but more importantly. Not only is he a friend, but he is a phenomenal father. He's a phenomenal husband. And why that matters to me is the message is simple. When you put family first, 
when you serve others first, your, your career is already paved for you because you are going to attract people that have that same belief and they're going to pave that path for you. I, I truly believe that. And that is, that is absolutely my story. That's his story. That's many other composers story. But what I've noticed um, is most people have this fear that they might pursue this career. They might pursue this success of writing for film, TV, video games, but they're going to destroy their family in the process. And unfortunately, I see it time and time again where people just destroy their lives and they ruin the most fulfilling part of their lives, which is their family, and they trade it for a successful career. And you can kind of hear the, the angst in their voices when they tell their stories and it's, it's heartbreaking. Uh, and so my mission, and I hope your mission as well, and I, I ask you to join me in this, is to share this message of putting family first. It's that simple. So with that in mind, the big news is not only that I'm done with the book, but there's going to be a really big book launch around this. Um, many of you may know this is, this is my first book. This is something I've been really wanting to do for a long time, but the, the timing is finally right where I've had the support structure and I've had mentors pour into this. And it's just been this, this beautiful conglomeration of, um, of this message I've been trying to get across. So what I invite you into, there's going to be a book launch team. You can go to stephenmalincom slash launch team. And there is an application there. It's going to be open from right now through Sunday, March. Let me look up the date. Sunday, March 17th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, so it's a very simple application. There's a few questions to answer. I can't take everybody, but I want to take as many of you that fit the bill. The goal is this. I want to assemble 25 people, 25 team members that... Let me open the application. I'll show you. Um, I want I want these, these applicants... Um, I want them to be super enthusiastic about this book and the message of it and the launch of this book. Um, the book is around 160 pages. Um, and I want you to read that in a month. That's about three hours of reading. If you're an avid reader, that should be no big deal. Um, and I hope there's a lot of good content in there for you that you can apply to your life. Um, I want you to write an Amazon review on day one of the release, um, which is to be announced to those members. Um, but it's going to be soon, um, within the next month or so, um, spread the word to your friends and communities and to set aside 30 minutes each week for four weeks to work on the launch. So those who can be a part of this, um, you're going to get some cool rewards, some exclusive rewards that I, I hope bring some value to your life. You're going to get an advanced reader copy of the book and get a free copy of the published book. Um, your name's going to be in the acknowledgement section of the book. Um, you're going to have a secret Facebook group and more freebies that come along with that process. So if that interests you at all, or if you even have questions about what that means, please reach out and message me. Um, I can't do this without you. I absolutely need your help. Um, I'm so excited to finally have the final product, but it doesn't mean anything if it's not resonating with my audience. And if I don't have that team support to share that message, because I really believe that this, this is going to transform some lives. It's going to rescue um, some dads um, who are just, they're heartbroken because they want to serve their families, but they just don't know how to make a living as a composer. Um, so many, um, so many single guys who they're, they're, they're coming out of college and they might have the education, but man, they just, they don't know where to start. They don't have that music business, business savvy. Um, they don't know how to start earning income. They don't know how to do this. So some of the, some of the core reasons behind this that, that I hope you can rally with me, this book is going to show you, um, how to choose a compelling why for your music business. Cause without that you're toast. Uh, you're going to lay the foundation of a successful music composition career. That foundation, if you're not building on the, a, a sturdy foundation, it's going to crumble. You might get three years in and you just hate your life. You hate your career because you didn't build it on what matters. You're going to learn how to create multiple streams of recurring monthly income immediately. 
because you're going to put your music to work. You're going to find places uh, and I'll guide you through that process. Um, you're going to be able to equip your music studio with the most effective hardware and software. You're going to establish habits for business growth. You're going to implement business strategies for scaling quickly. This does not have to be a super long thing. It's a long-term strategy, but there are so many um, great small wins that you can have now that are going to start bringing in the income soon and make that switch from part-time to full-time and be able to support your family. Um, and ultimately, it's going to give you practical steps and next steps to take after finishing the book for continuing your growth as a composer, supporting your family. So that's the application process. I'm really excited to, to bring you guys on board for that. So if that's something that interests you, I'll put that description as well in the show notes. Um, but we only have a few days to fill that out. So please, uh, please jump on that if that's something you want to be a part of, because I can't take everybody. Um, and just as a kind of some final thoughts, I'm actually going to be recording the audiobook version of the book soon. Um, because with the release date, I want to have an ebook. We're going to have the physical hard book and the audio book. And so the audio book, I'm actually going to be recording it live. I thought that'd be a fun way to include you guys. So that's going to be a YouTube live for four days. It's going to take me four days to record this thing. Um, and so I want you guys to be a part of that. And that's going to be Mark your calendars, March 25th, 6th, 7th, and 8th. So March 25th, 26, 27, 28. That's Monday through Thursday. I want you guys to be a part of that. Um, it's it's going to be several hours each day, and I don't expect anyone to stick around the whole time, but I just think it's a fun way. I know I'm going to need that encouragement from you guys. Um, and even if you can't be a part of the book launch itself, um, any one that you feel that you can connect this mission to will be of great help. Anyone that you feel confident you can share it with. If you have some friends or maybe you have, maybe you're, you're the one that you feel stuck in your career and you're not making that progress. And this is, this could be a game changer for you. So, um, I appreciate you guys so much. And I know I went a little bit long on the live stream. Uh, I had some technical glitches at the beginning of this thing, but I appreciate you guys sticking around. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to giving you more announcements and more updates throughout this process. But for those who want to jump in on the launch, stevenmalin.com slash launch team. Thank you guys. And I'll see you next time.